Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mark Lawrence. I'm the director of the LBJ Presidential Library and Museum. What a great sight it is to see so many people gathered here for another in-person event, one of the first in-person events we've done since we reopened to the public, though I also want to hasten to welcome those who are joining us tonight via live stream. Wonderful to have all of you as well. Before introducing our special guest tonight, I want to express our gratitude to the Moody Foundation for generously sponsoring this and so many events at the LBJ Library. I also want to call your attention to an upcoming event. On the evening of May 11th, we will host the author and podcast host Julia Swig, who will speak about her book, Lady Bird Johnson, hiding in plain sight. I hope you all can join us for what promises to be a really interesting evening with Julia. Tonight's special guest is Will Hurd, who represented Texas's 23rd Congressional District in the US House of Representatives from 2015 to 2021. During those years, he earned a reputation for bipartisanship and made especially important contributions in the area of cybersecurity. Before winning his seat in Congress, Mr. Hurd served as an undercover officer in the CIA. Will is a native of San Antonio and a graduate of Texas A&M. He's a trustee of the German Marshall Fund and a board member of OpenAI and managing director of Allen & Company. Will is also author of the book at the heart of our program tonight, American Reboot, an Idealist Guide to Getting Big Things Done, a book that has been widely and warmly praised by innumerable reviewers. Uh, UT's own Admiral William McRaven spoke for many, I think, in writing, Will Hurd is exactly the kind of public servant we need today, and American Reboot will show you why. Moderating tonight's conversation is J.R. DeShazo, the Dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs here at UT Austin. J.R., it's wonderful to have you, and I appreciate your collaboration on this and so many projects. In a little while, there will be an opportunity for a few questions from the audience, so please hold your questions until later, and we'll pass around a handheld mic, probably this one. Um, for your use. Also, please note that we'll continue to sell copies of American Reboot at the end of the program. So I encourage you to pick up a copy if you've not yet done so. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Will Hurd and J.R. DeShazo. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Will, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, let's start with um, what were you trying to accomplish in writing this book? Can't hear you. Let's try this. Can you hear me now? Testing. How about this? There Testing. we go. Um, so, so the question was, what, what was I trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Look, 72% of Americans think the country's on the wrong track. And this has been a feeling that has been growing for a number of years. And, and I want to say there's another way. Right? There's, we don't have to accept the status quo. And I, I start the book off with a, the, a lesson I learned in the CIA. It's, it's literally the second lesson you learn when you're at the farm. <clears throat> the farm is uh, what I used to call the super secret CIA training facility, uh, but now it's on Google Maps. And <laughs> I wish that was a joke. It really is, it really is on Google Maps. And, um, and they tell you get off the X. The X is a location where something's going down, and the last place you want to be when something's going down is where it's going down. Mm -hmm. right? and, and so I, I tell a story about how I almost got dragged out of a car and, and beaten to death, um, and about how getting off the X helped there, and that this is a, the concept that we have to think about in our country because we sometimes focus on, we're focusing on some of the wrong issues sometimes, and we're not putting the brain power and the attention to what I think are, are generational defining challenges that are going to affect 
whether America, whether this century stays the American century. And I want it to be, and, and it's not a fait accompli that the rest of this century is gonna be the American century. So um, that's what I wanted to do, mm-hmm. and, and, and the, the concept of the book came because I haven't always believed the way, or uh, I haven't always th- held some of these opinions, and I tried to give the reader I tell a bunch of stories that led to those conclusions. Right. And so I wanted to take the reader on the same journey that I've been fortunate to have, whether it was in you know, dangerous places, in exotic locales overseas, or mm-hmm. the halls of Congress, or in the uh, boardrooms of, of international businesses. Yeah, really captivating stories. Uh, and you, you talk a lot about polarization and, and where our country is mm-hmm. today in terms of uh, extreme polarization. Could you describe a couple of uh, strategies um, that you think would, mm-hmm. would reduce that? So structurally, our, our political system is designed and is, and is, is causing this polarization. Mm. And what do I mean by that? Look, I, I do believe that two parties are, it's important to have two parties. I always tell people, yes, I'm a Republican, but this book is not just for Republicans. Um, Democrats should care about it. Independents should care about it. Mm-hmm. People that don't vote should care about this because this is about how we solve the big challenges that, that we're facing. Mm-hmm. And so what I learned in my district, Texas 23, 29 counties, two time zones, 820 miles of the border. Mm-hmm. It took 10 and a half hours to drive across it at 80 miles an hour, um, which was the speed limit in most of the district, but Justin Hollis, my political consigliere who's here, uh, learned it's not the speed limit in all of the district. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> sorry, Justin. Um, and, and, and it was, I'm a black Republican, and I ended up representing a 71% Latino district. Mm-hmm. Nobody thought I had a chance. Mm-hmm. And it was the only seat in Texas that would flip back and forth between Republican and Democrat, and that happened for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And so, so I was able, to, if every Republican voted for me when I first ran, I would still lose. I had to get independents, I had to get Democrats, and, and, but I also, when I got elected and solved problems, I was rewarded for that when it came time for reelection. Mm-hmm. And so, so that experience really, really hardened my brain that uh, this is how we should solve problems. Now, if I had a magic wand, I would create every political district no more than plus six in either direction, meaning 56% Democrat or 56% Republican. Mm -hmm. To me, a plus six in either direction is a jump ball. Mm -hmm. Anybody can win that election in November. Mm -hmm. I don't have a magic wand. That would require 50 states to make decisions to do that. And we all know that uh, redistricting is about incumbent protection. Both sides do it. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? We need more people voting in primaries. And and I I go into some of the math in in the book. In the last non-presidential election, there were only 34 contested seats. And, And I consider contested to be a party uh, a, a district that votes for um, one party for president and another party for the House. 34. That's 8% of, congr- of, of House seats. Right. And that number for state, state uh, reps, state senate, across country, city mm-hmm. council, it's, mm-hmm. it's, the, it's, it's very similar. In those seats, so, so that means 92% of seats are actually decided in the primary. In the last non-presidential election, the average number of people that voted in a contested primary was 54,000 people. That means, yeah, all the groans, for those on TV, there's a whole huge groan in the audience. That means 26,501 people decide who 92% of the seats. Mm -hmm. That is, about 3% of the voting population in that community. Now, in a district like mine, that was decided in November, the average was north of Mm 260,000. What would you rather have deciding, 260,000 people or 54,000 people? Or actually, uh, divide both those numbers by half. Right. So, 
We need more people voting in primaries. Our state just went through a primary. Only three million people voted. We can have debates about, was, is it hard to vote? Is it not hard to vote? I think it's, it's, we should make it easier for people to vote. I think we should have online registration to vote. We should have same-day registration to vote. But we can clap for that. <laughs> but we should also be able to confirm the identity of somebody voting. Mm -hmm. right? All these things are true. Mm -hmm. All these things are true. And so, so um, but... When only 3 million people vote, out of 30 million, the majority of those people didn't vote because of voter apathy, because they don't care about what either side is providing. Mm -hmm. The first time I was here for South by Southwest, and so that's a very long-winded answer. Um, the first time I was here at South by Southwest, I was on a panel with some YouTube stars. The other four people had a combined one billion subscribers for YouTube. I had 60. <laughs> right? Like I'm like, I'm like, why am I here? But what? Hey, I'm here. Let's go with it, right? And one of the one of the people on the stage was the digital director for The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. Mm -hmm. And the movie Moana was coming out. Mm -hmm. And she asked the crowd, she says, if Moana fails at the box office, are we going to blame moviegoers for not going to the movie, or are we going to say it's a crummy movie? Now, I'm not saying Moana's a crummy movie. I've seen it. I, I think it's a quite delightful movie. Um, and and it, it, was a, it was a box office success. Mm -hmm. And her point was, only in politics do you blame the purchaser of the good or service when they, when, they, when they don't like a good or service versus the person providing the good or service. Right. And so for me, the broader problem is, the reason we have, I think, this apathy is because we don't have elected officials or people running for office that try to inspire people. Mm -hmm. They're more interested in fear-mongering. Mm -hmm. and, and that is why, and guess what? Look, everything I'm saying and talking about, it's hard. It's, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. The professional political class, people like Justin, they want to do the same thing in 12 different races. Mm -hmm. They want to talk to the likely Republican primary voters or the likely Democratic primary voters. And when you only talk to the same, when you talk to the same people over and over, you're going to get the same results. Mm -hmm. But the ability to get those people that are reliable voters but don't vote in primaries mm -hmm. is probably two or three times harder to do than it is traditionally. And that's why people don't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But guess what? If we're going to get off the X, we got to do things a little differently. Right, right. So just building off of that, you know, leading up to this evening, I, I was talking to some friends about, about your visit. And, and they said, oh, you know, is he going to run for president? Uh -huh. And I said, well, I'm not going to ask him that. Um, but, but I'm just going to let it hang out there. I, I, do, I, do want to, um, I, I do want to ask you about leadership, because you mentioned that there are some that, that lead and motivate people um, by manipulating their fears, uh, channeling their anger and grievances. Um, what kind of a leader would you say you are or aspire to be? Look, I, I try to inspire, right? How? I, and, and, and I do that by doing some things my dad taught me. My dad's black, my mom's white. My dad's from, from East Texas. My mom's from Indiana. They met in California and Los Angeles. Um, got married, moved to San Antonio, Texas in 1971. My dad is 89 years old. He grew up in, in Jim Crow South. You know, East Texas is really where like white primaries and, and Jim Crow originally started. He, he, saw, he saw all of those things. Uh, when he was a traveling salesman, he couldn't stay in any hotel or he couldn't go into any restaurant, right? Like all, all those things. Mm -hmm. and, and my dad always said to have a PMA, a positive mental attitude. Right. He had that even though when he was the first black salesman in every company he worked for, that they would throw the N-word at him, scream at him, do all these things. He still kept a positive mental attitude. Right? And if my dad could do that when that, he was going through that, 
And when my mom could have a PMA, you know, my mom would, would um, you know, have these three little dark babies, you know, and, and my mom, she would get sunburned just walking out to the mailbox, right? <laughs> and, and, um, and people would look at her weird. My parents today live in the house they live in because it was the only place in San Antonio that would sell to an interracial couple, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so, so for me, you know, PMA is really at the core of, of who I am. I learned it because I saw it from my parents, and it's always worked for me. Uh, the other thing my dad told me is the one person you can't fool is the one person you're looking in the mirror, right, when you're shaving. He actually learned that lesson from a gangster um, in Atlanta prior to being in jail with Jack Ruby. Long story, um, long story. It's in the book, you know. We'll look into that. Um, and 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 so so for me, it was always let's be honest, right? And and I've I've been lucky. I've been lucky to um, have experiences from you know my time at Texas A&M when when Bonfire collapsed, and 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 being part of a community. Uh, that was really grieving, right? Worst, worst disaster that's ever helped, ha- had happened on a campus up to that point. To my time in the CIA, learning from people where doing the right thing had consequences. Mm-hmm. And if you did the wrong thing, lives were gonna be lost, mm-hmm. right? And so, so for me, it's, it's uh, do the right thing, you know? And, and, and speak the truth always, even if it leads to your death. And, and so those are the things that I've tried to do Mm-hmm. And um, I, I think that's why it resonates. And, and look, my social media footprint would be 10x what it is now if I said crazy things, mm-hmm. right? Um, the pressure is always there to say crazy things. Um, but you have to resist it because you got to, and, and it's something I learned from um, uh, President George H.W. Bush is model the way, right? Model the behavior you want to see in others, and so that's that's what that's what I try to do. Great. Okay. Thank you. So, picking up on the the, the theme of race, which mm-hmm. you just touched on, um, it feels like conservatism is is fracturing a little bit, and and in writing your book, sometimes it feels like you're speaking to everyone. Sometimes it feels like you're speaking to Republicans. Um, and you know there are um, folks who feel like racism doesn't occur anymore, mm-hmm. and they'll point back to LBJ's accomplishments, right, in the '60s and '60s, '70s, and JFK's, and you know we have equality of opportunity. We don't have uh, racially unjust policies. They would claim. Um, how do you? And one of the challenges I, I feel like with that group is even starting the conversation. Mm-hmm. How, how do we have a conversation about racism, racism in this country? I, and I can't think of a better person in the world to ask, how do you suggest we talk about it? So the, I, I was talking to some specific people, especially the title of the book that says, uh, the chapter that says, don't be an a-hole, don't be a, a misogynist, don't be a homophobe, yeah, 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 you know. Um, uh, yeah, that yeah. was that was targeting a very specific group of people. Yeah. Um, that, that's chapter three, yeah. if you, if you want to look. Yeah. Um, so a, a, a president of, uh, of an HBCU once, once um, told me, we have eliminated racism from our laws and our policies, but we haven't eliminated it from our hearts and our minds. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a harder, that is a harder thing to deal with. Mm-hmm. It's, it's hard for some people to understand how um, hundreds of years of something has an impact on a culture. And, and, and I always use, uh, I, I, I use myself as an example. My brother, sister, and I, we're not able to go to the best public schools in San Antonio. We weren't, Mm -hmm. because my parents weren't allowed to live in the neighborhoods that had the best public schools. Mm -hmm. Now, I got over that issue, right? I turned out okay, but when you look at um, some of the folks in in my broader neighborhood, Mm -hmm. uh, haven't had the similar kind of success, right? And so that's just one example I try to use to people. 
Um, during George Floyd and all the aftermath of George Floyd, I would I I I, I wrote I think I wrote an op-ed about about people asked like I went to the the march down in Houston, and look, most of my staff was like, "Don't go." Mm-hmm. Because they thought that it was gonna, you know, that potentially there'll be violence, and it'd be like, you know, Congressman Heard was, you know, at some at some riots, right? Mm-hmm. But but I went because, again, one of the things I learned when I was at Texas A and M, a community's got to grieve together, right? And and I try to tell people it's like you can be outraged that a black man was killed in the custody of the police by a white officer that someone who wears a uniform to protect and serve did not do their job. You can be outraged by that. You can also be outraged by people looting and rioting. And you can be thankful that the police is there allowing you to exercise your first man. There's not an or, Mm -hmm. it's an and, Mm -hmm. right? And so sometimes everybody wants to get into it's it's an A or a B. It's, it's It's never that simple. Right? It's never that simple. And so when I was trying to explain to that, explain that in this op-ed, I talked about how the time my dad had to talk. And I'm not talking about the birds and the bees. Mm-hmm. It's when you get pulled over by the cops, how you handle yourself. Right? And it was keep your hands on the steering wheel, turn the light on. Roll down your window. Don't make a move. Always tell the officer what you're going to do before you do it, and make sure you get approval to do that. Don't make sudden movements, right? This was something my dad was telling me. And I would have a lot of people come up to me and say, well, I told that to my daughter, and and we're white. Well, you told that to your daughter so she didn't freak out when she got pulled over by the cops. My dad told me that because he was afraid I was going to get killed by the cops. And, and so, so that is, a, and again, all of these things are true at the same time. And so it starts with, it starts with um, no one's attacking the other side. It's about having a conversation and explaining a different perspective, right? And, and it's, look, it's empathy, it's compassion. And, and I learned this, look, I learned this because I was the only kid that looked like me in school. And then, you know, look, learning when I, was in, when I was in the CIA, being completely different cultures and learning and understanding how those cultures have an impact, you can look at your own. So, so that's, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a rambling answer to a specific question. And the specific question is, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to think about this. Like, it's okay to say, slavery happened. Jim Crow happened. We had to fight the civil rights, and it's, these things are still happening, right? But it, it's okay to admit those things. You're, and, but when you admit those things, you're not saying that you're part of it, mm-hmm. right? And, and I think that's a, I think that's, and, and one, by the way, don't use this as a political bludgeon, mm. right? Like, actually, let's have a conversation about it and not be like, aha, you did something wrong, or the, uh, you know, the, that, you know, the other sides would do the exact same. Okay. So building on this sort of theme of, of maybe conversations with the Republican Party, maybe conversations more broadly, um, I don't know what chapter it is. Somewhere in the middle of the book, you know, you, you define democratic socialism as ownership of the means of production by by workers or by consumers, Mm -hmm. really appreciate it as an academic, the care you took to sort of define what socialism, and then you talked about democratic capitalism Mm -hmm. and why it's it's superior and what it's done for us. And and then you close that chapter um, by citing Matthew 25, verse 40. And, you know, I know I'm in Texas. It may be that everyone knows Matthew 25, <laughs> verse 40. But um, we, we could back up to verse 30. And, um, you know, just to set the stage, Jesus is, is putting people on the right. It's, it's, it's judgment day. That are go, yeah. judgment day, going to heaven and on the left who aren't. And um, the folks on the right are sort of looking at him like, how did we get here? And he says... 
For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then he goes on, you know, the culminating verse is, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So what lessons do you draw from that verse mm -hmm. for designing public policies to address inequality? Not everybody has benefited, right? And, and so, so it, but, and, and the, 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 I open this section um, talking about don't, th you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Just get rid of the bathwater. Yeah. Right? And, and so, so not everybody has benefited. Not everybody has been able to move up the economic ladder. Um, not everybody has had the same opportunities to get access to education. I think we have income inequality because we have education inequality. And when we change that, we're going to be able to see people be um, to, to benefit from all these opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so those that haven't benefited, let's pay, pay, pay special attention to solving the things that's preventing that from happening. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean getting rid of the entire system. And so I think that's the nuance. Mm -hmm. Look, it's hard in public policy to have nuance. It's, it's hey, somebody didn't benefit, so it must be that thing. Mm -hmm. But 80% of everybody else is benefiting from that thing. So let's figure out how the rest of the folks can. And so whether that's, whether that's healthcare, whether that's education, that's where our, our focus and attention should be, is how do you fix that problem for those individuals? Mm -hmm. And look, one of, the, one of my favorite parts about being in Congress, there's only a few. Um, I'm joking, that, that was a cheap joke. That was a cheap joke. Um, was helping people that battle the federal bureaucracy that needed it. And what I learned was, when we would have a constituent with a problem, we focus on solving that problem for that one person. Because mm -hmm. when we figure out how to solve it for that one person, we can figure out how to solve it for thousands of people. And so let's start with, let's find that person or that entity or that, that individual that's having that problem. Solve that problem, and then we're going to be able to, and then, and then put it into, into a, the macro system. And then you can solve it for everyone else that's having that same problem. Mm -hmm. And then you move on to the next one. And so, so that's where I think you, you know, how you apply this to public policy. Mm -hmm. And guess what? How, do you, how you deal with homelessness in Austin is different than how you deal with it in San Francisco, is different than how you deal with it in Midland, right? And so, so, so let's focus on how do you, what, it, what that problem is that is preventing those people or that individual from getting access to something mm -hmm. and fix it for them. Right? And, and then guess what? We have examples mm -hmm. of how it's worked for other people. So let's figure out how to adapt that. And so, so right. that, is, that is why I think um, you know, this notion, and, and, I try, and thanks for recognizing, I try to be very clear about what socialism actually means and, and what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and getting rid of the, what has worked. And again, the, we talk about a more perfect union. We're never perfect. It's like we're striving. It's constant, right? We're still learning. It's called a, an experiment for a reason because nobody did it, right? When we did it, everyone was like, nobody else in the rest of the world was like, that ain't going to work. <laughs> Another democracy didn't come into existence until 60 years later, Switzerland. There are only 14 countries that have been a democracy for more than 100 years. We assume. It's always there. That's all we've ever known, mm -hmm. right? But, but it, it's, it's, democracy is fragile, and it's hard, and it's worked for a lot of people. It's not perfect, and so when it's not working for someone, let's focus on them and solve the problem for them, mm -hmm. and then we're all going to be better off. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let, let's talk for a minute about protecting democracy mm -hmm. and foreign policy. What do you see as the most important foreign policy threats to the United States today, and what do we need to change to get ready for those? Well, the, 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 the most important policy, because the, 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 the issue 
that will prevent the American economy from being the most important economy and will prevent this century from being the, the, the rest of the century being the American century is the Chinese government. And I say Chinese government. Mm -hmm. It's not the Chinese people. It's definitely not Chinese Americans. You know, what our Asian American brothers and sisters have been dealing with for the last couple of years here in America is unacceptable and it's wrong. Mm -hmm. But it's the Chinese government is, is what I try to be clear about. The Chinese government is trying to surpass the United States of America as the global superpower. Mm -hmm. It's not my opinion. This is not me laying awake and laying in bed at night pondering the universe, right? It's not me collecting intel when I was in the CIA. This is what the Chinese government has said about themselves in English, in their documents. So that is the, the broader issue, what I call the new Cold War. Mm -hmm. The US and China can coexist, we should. And guess what? I'm going to put my money down on freedom, entrepreneurship, openness, civil rights. I'm going to put my money on that any day of the week. But an authoritarian government can get somewhere first. And so, so we can coexist. We can compete with frenemies. But China has to agree and, 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 and use the rules that they agreed to. They gotta compete within the rules and the framework. If you join the, w, the World Trade Organization, then you gotta live by those rules. You can't be cheating, right? That's where we can, we can come, and, and, and I would take us any day of the week. Even though the Chinese economy is gonna be bigger than ours, the, the population is bigger than ours, we forget we were so much bigger than Russia and the Soviet Union. Right, like, like there, there's, there's no comparison. Mm -hmm. I always say it's like you have like a basketball and a baseball is the comparison of the U.S. and the Soviet Union, now R Russia. But when it comes to um, China, it's two basketballs. Mm -hmm. And there's probably a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, so, so that's the real threat. Now, the immediate problem is Russia. I'm of the opinion the United States and NATO is not doing enough to support Ukraine. <coughs> I have a simple philosophy. When it's, I've been connected with national security for over two decades. Your friends should love you, and your enemies should fear you. Mm -hmm. We have given a lot of support to Ukrainians. There's no question about that. I'm not debating that. But there is more that we can be giving, and there's more that the Ukrainian government is asking for and we should be doing. The Russians are continuing to up. On a scale of 1 to 10, what the Russians are doing in Ukraine, I'd probably say it's somewhere between 6 and 7. Mm -hmm. They still have a ways to go. The level of death and destruction that they've leveled on Mariupol, they can do across the country. Mm -hmm. They're continuing to execute on these things because they're not afraid that anybody else is gonna to come to the, to the Ukrainians back. Right. People wanna say, well, that's gonna escalate. Oh, and like in 2015, we said when we gave the Ukrainians javelins, that would cause the Russians to go into the country. Or, oh, we better not put sanctions on in December, we better not put sanctions on the Russians because that's gonna cause them to go into Ukraine. We can't control what they're gonna do, but we can control a first principle. And to me, we gotta prevent the unnecessary massacre of innocent people. And then be prepared. Yeah. And be prepared for the consequences. Mm -hmm. And I think we are. Mm -hmm. We can be. So, 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 and then why does Ukraine matter? Before, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Could, could you, what, would, what more would you do? Uh, specifically 20 migs is not going to cause like give those migs right we should have had that like give the anti-aircraft craft missiles if we're like um general breedlove was a former i think nato commander and then um um uh, former ambassador to nato um i'm drawing a blank on on his name kurt volker um they had a piece where they talked about a a humanitarian no-fly zone which basically it says hey you can't fly in here. We're not going to attack stuff on the ground. We're just going to say we're going to in, anything in the skies. Mm -hmm. um, we're not seeing the kinds of, of aerial dogfights that um, we saw in, in Sarajevo or Serbia. 
uh, but having some anti-missile weaponry mm -hmm. that the Ukrainians can do in order to defend their cities, mm -hmm. uh, we should be doing those things. I, I, I think all like that list, all of those things, do that tomorrow. Now we also need a Marshall Plan uh, for Ukraine now. now every, I think everybody is saying, we need a Marshall Plan for everything. The Marshall Plan was there to rebuild Europe. We need another plan to rebuild Europe, specifically Ukraine. And we need to be helping the Eastern European countries that are dealing with populations that are under the threat of war. It, the closer you are to Russia, the, the more impactful sanctions are. Mm -hmm. So you have a community dealing with that. And then you have the growing humanitarian crisis of the refugees that are coming into these countries. Um, I think in, in Warsaw, in two months, they saw the population increase by 14%. Right. Yeah. And I yeah. interrupted. You were talking about why Ukraine matters. Well, well Ukraine matters. The, and, and, and I'm also of the opinion that we shouldn't have pulled out of Afghanistan. 3,500 people in Afghanistan is a small footprint. Mm -hmm. um, $2 trillion has been spent in Afghanistan over 20 years. We were there, we lost sight, and our elected officials and our policymakers failed to remind the American people why we were there. We were there to respond to an attack on our homeland and to prevent a place, for the preconditions from, from coming back to create that situation that caused uh, the worst destruction in America, even more so than um, uh, um, Pearl Harbor. And a small footprint would have allowed the, um, the, we would not have seen the Afghan government fall. Now, the pullout, and, the, and this is not just, I'm not just criticizing the current administration, I've criticized the last administration, because the beginning of the end was when the last administration negotiated with the Taliban without the Afghan government there. Mm. And when there was a change in power, and that was continued by the current administration, that's when the Taliban's like, this is our chance. So, Putin saw that. He miscalculated, he miscalculated the resolve of the Ukrainian people, but he also miscalculated what uh, the Western alliance would be willing to do. Miscalculated the, the, the Germans. Right. Heck, like, I always try to explain to people, what, like, what's going on in Germany would be like, imagine if America went from Ronald Reagan to Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's kind of what happened in, in Germany. And then Bernie was, and that guy was like, send him all the weapons, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, sorry, that was loud. Um, and so, 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 so Putin misjudged that. Yeah. Now, the Chinese government is watching this mm -hmm. and seeing how the world is reacting because the Chinese government is interested in invading Taiwan, mm -hmm. period, full stop. Mm -hmm. Xi Jinping is interested in recreating the, the, you know, how China looked back in the fourth century. And if they go into Taiwan, they're gonna own, the Chinese government is going to own 70% of the semiconductor manufacturing in the world. Mm -hmm. We think supply chain problems are, are, are supply chain issues are bad now. Mm -hmm. Wait until the Chinese government owns 70%. And when we actually can get something, it's gonna be super expensive. Right. And it's not just your fancy car or your smartphone or your computer, it's things like your refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And so, so what is happening in Ukraine is prelude to how things, future conflicts, potentially unfold. Mm -hmm. And that's why further support to Ukraine, because there is no diplomatic solution right now that the Ukrainians are willing to give, or Vladimir Putin's accept as a face-saving mechanism that he can go back and explain, this is why we did all this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The, the, there, that doesn't exist right now. Mm -hmm. I think the US could potentially do things like um, offer um, uh, uh, nuclear de-escalation on the, on the continent, if the Russians did the same thing. I think you could have some of those conversations, mm -hmm. but, but the environment doesn't exist mm -hmm. for a third party to offer something in order to get uh, the Russians out. Oh, and by the way, the Ukrainians have to negotiate that. The US, Europe can't negotiate that on behalf of the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. So give the Ukrainians everything they can to, to try to defend themselves and push the Russians back out of, out of their country. And, 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 and if we, the sooner this ends, the less stability we're gonna see in the, in the um, European, uh, mm -hmm. it, it less this, uh, destabilization that we're gonna see across the world. Right. So you, you set up the, the Chinese threat, potentially. 
in terms of our response, we can, are we ready militarily for conflict? Do we have the allies in place that we need to be successful against China? And you talked about supply chains, um, some of which, mu much of which is currently controlled by either Taiwan and or China. Um, what do we need to do to be more resilient and prepared for that conflict? Because we can, we can see it growing on the horizon, right, every day. The short answer to those three questions is no, no, no. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's what that's what's unfortunate. Um, our, the future of conflict is going to be in cyberspace. Can we operate in a uh, communication denied environment? Can we actually operate in that against a superior adversary? That's, the, that's ultimately the question that we're going to have to ask, which I mean is if we do get into a conflict, and look, it's in nobody's best interest. The Chinese government doesn't want to get into a shooting war. We don't want to get into a shooting war. The rest of the world doesn't want to get into a shooting war. However, are our ships or our planes going to be operate in the South China Sea if the Chinese government takes out satellites in space? Uh, the Defense in, in, uh, Intelligence Agency did a fascinating um, review on uh, overhead architecture. That's just a fancy way of saying satellites in space. And how space is no longer, it, it, space is now a contested domain. Mm -hmm. Because when the Chinese government is putting up satellites that has a claw, right? There's only one reason you have a satellite with a claw. It's going to damage something else, mm. right? It's going to cut something else. It's going to push something out of the way, right? And so, so um, we, it's, it's fascinating how, how much terrestrial activity happens um, from space. So can we operate in an environment where our communication systems are denied? Mm -hmm. Can we as individuals operate? If, if we didn't have access to a phone system for a week, would we be able to communicate with our family? Would we be able to talk to our friends? Like, would we, how would we be able to do that, right? So, so that is where, when we think about um, a military strength and power, that is we have to be able to operate in, 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 that, in that area. And Army's Futures Command here in San Antonio, uh, excuse me, in Austin, is, is, is working on that. Second piece, the Chinese government is pushing the, a, a narrative, and, and this is, the, the fact is correct. Out of the 190 countries in the UN, 140 have not supported uh, the Western sanctions against Russia. If you look at the map of who hasn't, it's like basically everybody in the Western Hemisphere. That's not good. No bueno, as we say in South Texas. And, and, and so we should be working with our allies. Um, when, when, uh, when I see a number of officials from the Middle East, they always say, Will, don't make us choose. And they're implying, don't make us choose between the U.S. and China because America is not going to like the option. Mm. Which is another reason why, again, I'm not trying to bring up all the controversial topics, um, but this is why trying to negotiate an, a, an Iran deal right now is not the best time to be doing something when you're not only going to upset one of our most important, or our most important ally in the region, Israel, but all of our Sunni Arab partners. Now, a lot of things we got to work out with our Sunni Arab partners, um, but but we need to be making sure that we're growing our posse, mm -hmm. and and I think sometimes we have failed to think about the importance of our soft power. When you look at what the Chinese government is doing with the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. When you look at the number of countries that are doing that, and this is basically development efforts um, to improve infrastructure and all these things. Now, a lot of those lead to debt traps and problems. A lot of the countries that have participated in it don't like it, um, but they're not doing that in every, everywhere. And so we need to be thinking through how do we, what is our national, our, our, our national economic security plan to counter what the, what the Chinese government is doing? Because, because ultimately, and, I, and I'll, end, I'll end with this, if the future of conflict is in cyberspace, it's going to be defined by a couple of technologies. 
5G, AI, quantum computing, probably hypersonics, space, biotech. And 5G matters. Not Look, it's going to be awesome to download season three of Ted Lasso in two seconds, right? I'm looking forward to it. As long as I am too. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, and the, but the latency that 5G gives us. That, so that means I do something on my phone. And then that goes into the cloud and it comes back, right? That trip with proper 5G is going to take one nanosecond. Our thoughts are in seven nanoseconds. So we're going to have the entire power of the internet in our hands, on the edge, in a device, in real time. And that's going to be able to do powerful things. And we're going to, that's going to what is going to turn AI, artificial intelligence, from dumb, I say AI now is dumb, to truly intelligent. So whoever owns that 5G infrastructure is going to own all the things that are built on top of that. Mm -hmm. And right now, Huawei, this is the Chinese company that builds um, all of the infrastructure needed for 5G, owns 30% of the world's 5G, uh, 5G infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Now, Vladimir Putin said whoever masters AI is going to master the world. Probably the only thing he and I agree on. And so I want AI to be developed with our values and our principles. Because if it's developed by the principles of, of the Chinese government, we know what that's going to look like. Because they're, they're doing it in Xinjiang province against the Uyghurs, the ethnic minorities there. They're trying to export that to other authoritarian regimes. And that is where we have to be working together. And this goes back to your first question, or second question. We got to have more friends. Right, right. Awesome. OK. Why don't we open it up to questions from the audience? And the way this will work is there's a microphone. Um, Mark currently owns it. <laughs> Sarah, See, if, if we were at Texas A&M, we would just have people yelling it out. You know, y'all yeah, a little yeah. more refined here. You know? All right. Sarah, I'll let you decide who gets to speak in what order. And, and when you get the mic, please uh, just briefly identify yourself and then ask your question. Yeah, Robert, ha uh, Robert Howell. Uh, well, I would like uh, to get your take on immigration. Mm -hmm. I'm from South Texas. Sure. We see chaos down mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Yet, we have a severe labor shortage yeah, in this close. country, you know, talking about the supply chain and mm -hmm. our need to produce things. We need low skill and high skill mm -hmm. and everything in between. What, what would be your sure. approach? Look, it's an important issue. It's why this is the uh, largest chapter in my book. Um, I, I was the only member of Congress, I think I'm the, in the history, the only member of Congress who ever stamped visas. Right? My, my day job was to stamp visas, and then at night I did my real job. And then I also was responsible for um, uh, crisscrossing international boundaries um, under an assumed name, let's just put it that way. Um, and, and so this was some of the experience I brought to this issue. What's happening at the border right now is an absolute crisis. Department of Homeland Security is potentially pre predicting with, um, as, it, as the weather starts getting a little bit, uh, a little bit wet warmer, potentially up to over 400,000 people coming across our border illegally a month. That's just like, those are staggering numbers, okay? So, and there's, there's multiple problems that is causing this, and there's multiple solu solutions to get out of this. Number one, you can't treat everybody as they're an asylum seeker. Asylum is very specific. You have to be part of a protected class, and the government has either got to be um, uh, targeting you or willingly not protecting you against being targeted because you are a member of that protected class. Coming here for just a job is not a reason for, for, for asylum. And taking advantage of this process is preventing actual people that, need, that are asylum seekers that need it. So this was a policy that was started under the last administration. 
And why it has continued on this administration, I do not know, but everybody is, treated, is being treated as asylum seekers. Stop that. Two, it is very hard to get from Tegucigalpa to Eagle Pass. There is infrastructure that is being used to move volumes of people. And we're not, and we know phone numbers, uh, license plates for buses, people that are moving this stuff. And we're not doing enough to dismantle the infrastructure that is moving people uh, throughout um, Central South America and, uh, and other parts of the world now. So this is no longer just a Northern Triangle issue. You have people coming from all over. Now, Northern Triangle is still an issue where we have to address the root causes that is causing people to leave those countries, and that's extreme violence, lack of economic opportunities um, in, those, in those countries. So we have to address that. And then we need to streamline legal immigration, because as you point out, every industry needs workers. Oh, by the way, when you're dealing with inflation and potentially going into a recession, it would be beneficial to have a couple more people paying taxes. So, so streamlining legal immigration um, is something that also, that also has to happen. All those things can be done concurrently. Um, we also need um, immigration judges for the people that are already here and going through this process to have that, have that delivered. Now, what, what is so, um, why I get so angry with this issue is all those things I outline, 70% of Democratic primary voters agree with it and 70% of Republican primary voters agree. And the reason we don't get anything done is because folks would prefer to use this as a political bludgeon against the other side than solving the problem. I know it, I've seen it, I saw it when I was in Congress, I write about it in, in the book, and oh, and by the way, we're better off for having the brain gain of every other country coming here. If a kid, is getting an advanced degree at the University of Texas at Austin, and they want to start a business in the great state of Texas, here's your visa. If the Chinese government wants to steal our IP, steal our technology, let's steal their engineers. All of these entrepreneurs saw what happened to Jack Ma and the, the, the woman who was like the first female billionaire in China who basically got wiped off the internet one day, right? All those engineers and folks are seeing that. And so, so those are the things that we, that we, have, to, that we have to do. And, 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 it's, it, and unfortunately, I don't know if we're gonna see movement on any of those things. Next question. <clears throat> I'm Dale Beulah. Um, if we think uh, refugees are a problem in uh, Ukraine, Wait till Bangladesh is underwater from sea level rise. Yeah, for sure. Uh, even coast, e even in the United States right now, people are migrating from fire danger, from climate change, as well as extreme heat. Uh, someone said that Vermont is having a huge influx mm -hmm. of people leaving California and the West Coast because of fear of climate change. Sure. But nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah. Look, I don't disagree with any of your premises. Um, I, the, the, the way I try to talk about this is I think to get more people to, to I, I think we need folks to think about this slightly different, and here's how I say it. Mother Earth is undefeated. There has been five extinction events, and, and Mother Earth is always going to win. This is about us preventing Mother Earth from doing something that wipes us off the planet. And, and, and I think that's an important distinction for people to, to understand about this issue. My concern is that the callousness that we looked at the significant loss of life following COVID, when you had a, a, a significant rise in deaths in a very quick period of time, the deaths related to climate change is going to be, is going to be over time, and it's going to grow over time. Um, it's not going to necessarily be shocking, like having you know, uh, several million people die in the span of a, of a year and a half. Uh, that's my concern with it. However, what I will say is if you're under the age of 35, 
they're demanding that elected officials at every level. They're demanding businesses. That, that cohort is so focused on this and are gonna be the ones that wanna come up with some of the solutions on how we can have, get, to, to get to carbon neutral. Um, and, and so, so that, that, that's, that's where I see some of these young folks, and regardless of political party, um, that, that care about this potential issue. And so, yeah, it, look, it, it's, it's gonna get worse before it gets better, right? And, and, but I do believe that, that the, some of the technologies that we're seeing, we're seeing how energy companies are using AI um, to use less water, uh, to, to, to have to put less water into the ground when they, when, they get, when they extract hydrocarbons. We're seeing how farming is able to use artificial intelligence to increase uh, crop yields while decreasing the amount of uh, energy and land that's used for that. And so I, I think there are some, um, some, some examples of how uh, technology is going to help us solve this problem um, that we have ignored for way too long. Hey, Will. Um, first off, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to just a great pair of boots that you have on. Uh, those are looking <laughs> thank good. you, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Secondly, I um, want to ask you a question about your former institution, the House of Representatives, and specifically um, the current state of the uh, House GOP. I, Want to get your thoughts on that, and also um, what advice you would give to uh, Kevin McCarthy in um, leading the conference currently? Sure. So, <clears throat> the lessons of 2020 was don't be a jerk and don't be a socialist. That is how President Biden had absolutely no coattails, and you saw Republicans winning in communities that nobody expected, or you saw an increase in, especially like Latino communities along in, in, in South and West Texas. However, the party that was supposed to learn the lesson, don't be a jerk, became bigger jerks, and the party that was trying to learn, that was supposed to learn the lesson, don't be a socialist, tried to become bigger socialists. And 2022, Republicans are taking the House back. There's, there's, there's almost no question about that, and likely taken back to Senate. And it's, and it's because the voters, it's not because the voters are upset that the Democrats haven't achieved some of the things that they thought they were going to achieve. It's because voters are upset with the direction that the Democratic Party was trying to go. Now, Republicans are going to take that as, aha, everybody loves us. No, they didn't like the other guys and gals. And so, so what I consider, we, we always want to talk about Trumpism. To me, Trumpism is too narrow about talking about some of the problems that we have. It's, it's the authoritarian wing of the Republican Party, which I'm concerned. And my advice would be, don't rule as an authoritarian. I firmly believe that the concentration of power in the hands of the few is a bad thing. Whether you want to concentrate in a single individual, or in the government, right? And so, so that's what I would say is, um, look, I've, I've never played hockey, right? But I always use a hockey reference because all my friends that played hockey. Skate's where the puck is going. We always want to fight battles, whether it's in the military or in politics, the last battle, not the next battle. And so we're going along the wrong lesson. Oh, and by the way, one of the reasons why we kept having these swings every two years for literally the last... 30 years, and, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong. The parties in power try to win by driving out their base a little bit more mm -hmm. instead of building coalitions and different coalitions. And so for me, my advice to the Republican Party is let's grow the coalitions when we have the chance and so that we can govern for 10, 12, 16 years and create a level of momentum that is necessary to solve some of these problems, right? That's, that now, again, everything I just said, it's really hard to do. Be and it's gonna be hard because most elected officials only care about the extremes rather than the middle, right? And so, so my thing is don't be afraid of constituents, talk to the middle, yeah, I mean clap for that. We have time for one more question. Sorry, I, sorry, I take too long in answering questions. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't see any 
Yeah, yeah. No, look, I I know that guy, so yeah, all right. Fine, yeah. That was not my intention. Um, so hi, my name is Jenna. Um, we spoke earlier. Um, and yeah, I am a here. student at the LBJ school, and I think there's a group of us here that are future policymakers mm -hmm. and future politicians. What advice would you give to us to try to undo some of the damage that has happened maybe in the last four, eight, 10 years? Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we build those coalitions? How do we solve some of these policy problems mm -hmm. in a way that is actually effective for the communities that we know and we love and we wanna mm -hmm. serve? Thanks for the question. Um, I call it pragmatic idealism. How do you help the greatest number of people possible based on the realities on the ground right now? And that requires people that want to inspire, like you got to inspire through the work that you're doing, not fear monger. You got to have that positive mental attitude. You got to make sure your audio and your video match, right? You got to make sure that the things that you do are reflective in the things that you say. The lack of ideological consistency is what is partly fueling some of this feelings and concern and lack and erosion of trust that the American public has at, at all institutions, from government at all levels, to academia, to the media. It's because people are not doing the things that they say that, that they're doing. And, and, I, and I, would, I, would, I would say it's that lack of, of ideological consistency, right? So be ideologically consistent. Recognize that way more unites us then divides us. I, I, look, I, I, am, I am firm in that. I saw that whether I was in the Colonias in, in, um, in, in El Paso or in the fancy neighborhood where all the San Antonio Spurs live, I would talk about the same thing. People care uh, and are interested in putting food on the table, a roof over their head, and making sure the people they love are healthy, happy, and safe. Focus on those things. And that's what's going to make sure that we're ready. And then we also, and, and, I, and I, I went in with this. America became an exceptional nation, not because of what we have taken, but because of what we have given. We were willing after World War II to give a helping hand to rebuild Europe that helped us. We are at our best when we are showing leadership, when we are engaged, Right? When we are living up to these values that we have enshrined in all of our foundational documents. And this is not, and this is always, this is an imperfect system. And the goal is to always strive to be a more perfect union. And as long as we're continuing to move forward on those things, then you and your colleagues and your friends are going to make sure that America, you're going to help us make sure America. Um, stays the most important economy in the world, and that this century continues to be the American century. Awesome. American Reboot is available in the, in the back right corner. And join me in thanking you well. <laughs>